We've been studying the last couple of weeks about the, the issue of the resurrection and, and uh, our new house, our home. And Paul refers to it as a house, as we talked about last week. And we're, we're going to go on from that, but we've got those two messages I said earlier available for you if you want them. Plus, they're also on the uh, YouTube. But this morning, I thought I'd do something different, and I, I'm doing this based on some of the things that were said in the meeting up in, in Chicago. And as I said earlier, based on Acts 20:24, 20, uh, you know, it was the idea of uh, staying the course and staying on our ministry and finishing the course. And we certainly want to do that. And, uh, and the day we're living in today, the Word of God is, is just poo-pooed. It's just put aside. God is not real, you know. You, you folks are just got a crutch to lean on, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But the Word of God is real, and it's strong, and it's powerful. And uh, if it's not the truth, I want to ask you, where is the truth today? There is none. Pilate asked the Lord Jesus Christ when he was before him, before he went to the cross. He says, what is truth? And you know what he did? He turned and walked away. He didn't let the Lord answer that because he knew he knew what the truth was, and he won't it. <laughs> Pilate won't it. But even the worst of men at sometimes in their lives comes to realize that there's a power, and there's a power greater than they are. And we need to know who that is, and we need to know most of all how to approach him. So let's turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning if we can get through it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. All of you know that by heart, don't you? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Paul says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed of rightly dividing the word of truth. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for our great salvation. We thank you for your word this morning that we can rightly divide it. We thank you for the power of that word. And we thank you, Lord, that we are in a position where we can stand before you one day approved or we can be ashamed. Help us, Lord, to look at ourselves this morning and say, do you want to be approved or do you want to be ashamed? And I know the answer. Lord, help us as we study to understand more and more your word. We realize your word is so much greater than we are. It is so much more expansive and powerful that we can never really understand all of it but we can study it to try. The most important thing is to rightly divide the word of truth. And if we can do that, Lord, we know that we will stand before you approved because we're in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Second Timothy 2.15 is a standard verse of scripture that so many dispensationalists used. Years ago, I had a person come into our church down in Tampa and uh, he was, he had understood the grace message, but he was like a lot of other folks. You know, he was in a family where his wife was a very devout member of another church and a belief. And he could not get her to see the message. He couldn't get her to come. And so she did visit us a couple of times. And so one time she came and I was talking with her, and I was talking about this verse of Scripture. And she says, why do y'all always talk about that verse of Scripture? She says, do you know that that word study is only in the, the whole of the New Testament twice? I says, yes. Both times by Paul. <laughs> yes. Why do you make so much of studying if it's not in there very much? Why did God put that verse there if we don't need to study? Why did he put that there telling us to rightly divide the Word of God if we can't rightly divide the Word of God? Are we just completely being duped to study? Is it not worthwhile? 
Is becoming a, a Bible scholar a, a, a bad thing? I remember years ago we had a young man come to our Bible study. Well, when we had a Bible study down at Bob and Laverne's years ago, he brought a man from his work. And he come for a long time, and he had a wife that was of another faith. And anyway, after two or three years, we were talking one day, and we went out fishing on the boat. Bob and this guy had a fishing trip with the company, but Bob let me go in his place, and I went with this other guy. And so we were talking about some verses of Scripture, and he says, you know, he says, after just two or three years here of Bible study like this, he says, when I talk to the other people in, his, in my wife's church and around in there here, I feel like a Bible scholar. <laughs> I say, wow. But you know what? If you get around most of the people that's in these churches and you talk about some scriptures and stuff and go down the line with them, you're going to find out they don't know what you're talking about most part. They don't know what you're talking about. Even some well-known scriptures that Bob shared with us about a, a neighbor shared some scriptures with us that says, I never heard that before. Where do you find that at? A friend of mine down in Tampa one time when was a pastor was talking to a, a, a pastor from another church, and he said, have you ever read Romans 16.25? And the guy says, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. What is that? So he quoted it to him. You know what Romans 16.25 is. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to him. He said, uh, the guy listened to that, and he said, let me read that in the Bible. And so he got the Bible, and he read it, and he says, I've never seen that before. That's what you're dealing with, folks. When you study the Word of God and you learn what God is doing today and everything, you're going to find that the majority of the world, a Christian or not, do not understand the Word of God rightly divided. They don't understand what God is doing today and what's going on. Well, why did Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, write that? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. By the way, this Second Timothy epistle is the last letter Paul wrote. This is the last thing he had to say. This is important. But there were some people there in that area with Timothy and the other churches that Paul had established that had got into a problem. They were mishandling the Word of God. Mishandling the Word of God. If you back up, just hold your face, everybody, just back up one page in your Bible, and you might even not have to turn back one page. But in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul says, This thou knowest. He's writing to Timothy now. Timothy, you know this, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelius and Hermogenes. What an indictment about all the followers of the Apostle Paul. All those that are in Asia have turned away from me. Now, you can interpret that any way you want to. I take it to mean just what it says, but it's hard to believe that all those people that Paul had led to the Lord there and had gotten the grace message had turned away from him. Or does it mean that they just, they understood the grace message and stuff, but Paul was a jailbird, so to speak, and so they wouldn't stand with him for fear of repercussions, whatever. They wouldn't stand. So he writes this letter to tell them you need to do something. Now, you need to be able to stand, and you need to be able to study to do that so you can be approved. Why do we need to listen to what Paul has to say about that? Well, come back to one of my favorite passages of scriptures. Come back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. This is that great letter that Paul wrote to the church over in Ephesus, telling them about the church, the body of Christ, and, and so forth, and how it stands, and, and who was the propagator of it, and so forth. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, Paul says this, For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Right off the bat, you need to ask yourself a question. For this cause, what cause? Why is Paul 
the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, Lord, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, that's a tremendous passage of Scripture. You need to highlight that, and you need to get that cold. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. He calls himself there the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Now, why would he, why would he address the churches in that fashion? Why is it that Paul is a person called out to go out to the Gentiles? Wasn't the Great Commission designed for the nation of Israel to go to all the Gentiles? Yes. God's purpose for all the Gentiles, all the nations to be saved was through Israel. But they turned away and they were in apostasy. And so when God calls Paul, it's something different. Something has changed. And it's got to be understood that Paul is our apostle today. Now, if you want to get into a knockdown drag out with most people, you tell them, you better follow Paul, he's our apostle. Oh, you're one of those Paulites, huh? Right off the bat, they don't like that. Baptist preacher told me one time, Paul was just a man and he wrote that down and I have just as much right to believe what somebody else wrote down as Paul did. You see, what is Paul's writings to most of the people today? Just writings. They're not really the perfected, saved word of God. It's just something that he wrote down. No, it's, it's the word of God. It's the thing that tells us who we are today. It's the thing that tells us about this dispensation of grace. Keep your finger there and turn back to Romans chapter 11. And I'm giving you some of these verses that I know you already know, but and some of you need to, to write them down and maybe make a note of them so you can remember them. Romans chapter 11 and verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Is Paul the apostle of the Gentiles? Yes. Does he magnify his office? Yes. Does Paul magnify himself? No. It's his office, the apostle of the Gentiles. That's very important. Our apostle. Come back to Ephesians. You know, in Ephesians, Paul in the, in the church describes the issue of dispensational timelines and so forth real clear for us. He makes it clear that there is things in the Bible that's time past. On your chart up here, you know what time past is. On your chart up here, you know what but now is, don't you? But you also know what's to come. The word of God, the dispensation of grace is being dispensed, but you need to understand these groups. You need to understand who they are. Paul says in, in chapter 3 there in verse 1 of Ephesians, for this cause I... Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you, Gentiles. Gentiles. A lot of people don't even know who Gentiles really are. Who are the Gentiles? The nations of the world other than Israel. Now, there is verses of scriptures where the word Gentiles means nations and it's inclusive of all nations. But usually it refers to the outside nations outside of the nation of Israel. Because God, God was dealing with Israel in time past. But how was he dealing with the Gentiles in time past? Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, if you're still in Ephesians 3, turn back one page. And look at two verses there in chapter 2. He's going to describe for you the beginning of a timeline. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, Wherefore remember 
Now, Paul's writing over to the church in Ephesus where he spent a lot of time. He says, now you remember, remember, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. In time past, from where Paul's at right here writing this letter, the Gentiles in the flesh were what? You are called the uncircumcision by that which is called a circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Verse 12, that at that time, what time? Time past. That at that time, in time past, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Gentiles were far off in time past. In time past, Christ did not minister to them. If you're familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember several passages of Scripture where he says as he commissions his 12 apostles, go not into the way of the who? Everybody awake? <laughs> Gentiles. Jesus said, don't go to the Gentiles. He didn't minister to the Gentiles. In Matthew chapter 15, he told the woman over there, he says, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of who? Israel. Is there a difference between Gentiles in the time past and Israel in time past? Yes. God was not dealing with those Gentiles the same way he dealt with the nation of Israel. I know today in this in this. God is love everything. They think that God always said everything he said to everybody at any time. You can go over in Isaiah and read something else and say, yeah, that's, that's to us. That's going to happen. Some people this past week read something in Isaiah and said, that's happening right now. Don't recall what the verse was. and doesn't matter. But they read everything in the Bible just like it's God speaking, but he's just speaking to anybody, anytime. Focus. You cannot study your Bible like that. You wouldn't go to the mailbox and get out a handful of mail and say, it's all mine. And then you get home after you've ripped it all open and you look at it and say, whoops, this is somebody else's mail. Do you have a right to that since you ripped it open, taken it? No. You don't have a right to Israel's program either. Gentiles back during time past before the cross, before the message was given to the Apostle Paul, they were without Christ. But not only that, come back to verse 12 again if you're still there, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise. All the promises that God made to the nation of Israel back there, the Gentiles were strangers to that. It has nothing to do with them. Having no hope. And without God in the world. Boy, that's a sad commentary on the nations. Why, why, is it that, why is it that way? Why is it that way? What has happened to all the nations out there that's got them where God just won't have anything to do with them? Well, if you come over to Romans chapter 1. Wait till I get there and I'll give you the verse if I can put my finger on it. Romans chapter 1, and I hope you're following along with me. So I'm trying to, trying to slow down a little bit so you can. But Romans chapter 1, verse 28, Paul is describing the nations back there during the time of uh, after the flood and before the flood. And he said, even as they, that's talking about the Gentiles now, did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to those to do those things. Notice, to do those things which are not convenient. They were filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, 
not only do this thing, but have pleasure in them that do them. That was the condition of the Gentiles back then. God gave them up, he gave them up, and he gave them over. He gave them over to let them, you just go do your thing. And if you've listened to any of Richard's teaching on Ezekiel and stuff back there, it's some really good teaching about how that God, God reached out to Israel and reached out to Israel, but he didn't reach out to the Gentiles because he gave them over to follow their gods, the little G's. They had their gods, but not the God of heaven. And they did not want to retain. Verse 28 highlighted, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. As I read that, and I read down through that list, and I look out in the world today, and I says, Lord, surely you must have been thinking about today when you wrote that 2,000 years ago. That's a description of us today. The nations today don't want God. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. No part of it. But, thank God, something happened. Come back to Ephesians. Keep your finger there because we're going to go back and forth. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. We've taken care of time past now. Everybody got that right? That's God's dealing with the nation of Israel and the covenants and so forth. He's not dealing with the Gentiles. Verse 13, but now, the center of your chart where the yellow's at, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Well, what does that mean? There comes a time when ye who were far off are what? Are made nigh to God. You didn't have no access to Christ. You didn't have no access to God. But now something has changed, and you have access by the blood of Christ. Something happened on that cross by the shedding of that blood that changed the status of the world, changed the covenants, made a way for God to suspend that covenant relationship with Israel and to set them aside, and now he can place everybody on level ground. Like the song, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Today, because of this message that's been revealed to the Apostle Paul, now all of us, have access by the blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. That doesn't mean at the cross, but by the blood of Christ. Who preaches the cross? Who preaches the blood of the cross? Who preaches forgiveness of sins by grace plus nothing? Paul. That's Paul's message. So things change. If we don't rightly divide the word of God, you're going to take some of Israel's message and try to claim it for you. And it would be just like you going down to the mailbox and I had a check coming from the government for $2,000 for a tax return and you got it and you went down and deposited it. You know what they're going to do to you when they catch you? You're going to go to jail. You can't get by with that. We cannot get by trying to take something from Israel that belongs to Israel. And Israel has so much today going for them, but they won't believe it. They won't believe it. Oh, that takes care of ages past. That takes care of but now. But what about in the time to come? In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul says that in the ages to come. Now, if we're talking about something that's ages means what? Time, times, eons, times to come. And the times to come down the road, what? He might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Back up there to verse 21 in chapter 1 
Ephesians 1, 21. Same page. Far above all principalities and powers and might and dominions and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. There are ages to come. There's time ahead for us. So many today get such... Failure to rightly divide does not separate people living in that time to come in the tribulation period, that time to come that's the kingdom reign of Christ on the earth, and that time beyond that in the ages, ages to come, times and times to come. We today, folks... We do not live in that time to come, but we live right now, right now. When you study your Bible, you ask yourself, who's speaking, who are they speaking to, and what is a time period? Is he talking about something that happened back in history? Is he talking about something that's going to happen in the future out there, maybe a million years away or whatever? Or is he talking about what's going on right now? We live today in the dispensation of God's grace. Israel's condition in time past, or pardon me, the Gentiles' condition in time past was bad. They had no hope. But now, because God's grace, God's program for today is what God is doing for today, not in time past. If you take all the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, prophetic scriptures, historical scriptures, all that God had done back there, how everything come into being, how he destroyed them, how he started over, all that he promised that he was going to do to the nation of Israel, that's what God is planning for the nation of Israel. But that's not what he's doing today. We don't jump from time past up to where we're at today and say, okay, time past is being fulfilled today. There's one prophecy preacher on TV that says, prophecy is being fulfilled all around us today. Every day, prophecy is opening up. We need to study. We need to get this stuff. We need to be aware of what God's doing. And you can look him right in the face and tell him God's not doing anything of that today. What God's doing today is building the church, the body of Christ, according to the Apostle Paul. But the moment you say the Apostle Paul, you get turned off. But now, what's going on but now? In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, that's where you're at, right? Look at verses uh, 14 and 15. Well, I'll tell you what, verses, uh, verses 14 through 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, you know what the middle wall of partition is between us, don't you? That's the law, covenant of the law, that's broken down, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, us two, one new man, so making peace. That reconciliation that God made by what he did on that cross changes that thing that exists between the two. And the two are made one. Now, so many read this passage of Scripture and they say, well, that's just talking about a person getting saved. Now he's a member of the body of Christ. One with Christ. No. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that are nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. The but nigh town we're living, folks, is God's grace. God's grace is to all men. 
It's an all-man gospel. I heard someone say that a few years ago. I think it was Brother Keith Blades probably. It's, it's, it's an all-man gospel. Paul explains this starting in the book of Romans in detail. What's happening? How we get saved? What grace means? In Romans chapter 9, let's look at that for just a minute. Keep your place there in, in Ephesians. Turn back to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And let's read the first five verses. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Romans, how it's divided up, you understand that when you get to Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, Paul is dealing with Israel here. Up to this point, he's been dealing with the body of Christ so forth. But now he says, I speak the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why do you think Paul wrote that? I know it's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but, but what would be, what, what is he saying? Some of them accused Paul of being anti-Semitic. He was against the Jews and he was promoting the Gentiles. He was letting the, the Jews be out. So what does he say? I lie not. My conscience also bury me in the Holy Spirit that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who is Paul's kinsman according to the flesh? Who's Paul's kinsman? Israel. Paul was a Jew. All we have to do is go to verse 4 and you get the answer, don't you? Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? You see all those things? Who do they belong to? Israel. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came? Who is over all? God bless forever. Amen. Paul tells you here about Israel's relationship to God in time past. But also he's making a point of the fact that now he wants to see them saved. This idea that he was to the Gentiles and to the exclusion of Israel was not so. The message of God's grace is to who? All men. All men. And Paul wants to see those Jews saved, my brethren. Boy, if anybody ever had a right to hate the Jew, who would it have been? Who would it have been? Paul. Now, why do we say that? Paul's a Jew. He was a, a rabbinical scholar. He had, had reached positions in his, his, uh, the Pharisees as above many of his own equals, he says. Why would he hate them? Well, what have they been doing when Paul writes this? What have they been doing for the last 20 years at least? Trying to do everything they can to kill him. See, they really hate him. Because now he's turned his back on Israel and he's going to the nations out here. But he hasn't turned his back on Israel. But that's what they think. Many people today base what they're doing on what they think instead of trying to understand what God is doing. Understand what God is teaching today and going with God. Israel's past back there in Romans 9 is fulfilled. Israel's program, not ours, pardon me, Verse 4, why did I say that? Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption? These things pertain to Israel, but they're not our promises. They're not our covenants. All these things 
were made between Israel and God. It starts all the way back with Abraham. I will bless thee that bless him. I will bless thee that bless you. And I will curse them that curse you. And that was the status of the nation of Israel up until the time when Paul comes on the scene and gets the message. No more. That's wiped out. No more. That's wiped out. That's suspended. Many churches today base their whole theology on what's called covenants. You know, you've heard of covenant theology, all these different things. Many churches are based on something other that has nothing to do with what God is doing today. They're either living in time past with the promises made to Israel, or they are looking at verses that have to do with the scriptures and saying that's what's taking place today. Right now, all this killing and these earthquakes and these storms and this weird weather and stuff is all according to these great scholars. All of these things are the fulfillment of what God said was going to come before he come back. And they are. But they're going to take place when? When are all these things going to take place? He talks about Matthew 24 and 25. Tribulation. Tribulation period. They're not today. It's not what God's doing today. It's still in the future. That's in the time to come. And so many things that he teaches about the time to come out there with the relationship between Israel and the Gentiles is being all messed up. You know, we've read the verses many times about in that kingdom when the nation of Israel was given their king, their land, and they're reigning here on this earth, where are the Gentiles going to be? Serving them. And people say, oh, no, that, that can't be. That's heaven. They're all the same. The kingdom reign of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth is not heaven, folks. We're going to be in heaven when that takes place, thank God. We're going to be up there with him, and these things are going to take place. Without right division, can you, can you see how you could stand before the judgment seat of Christ and find out, whoo, I was all wrong about all that stuff, but you won't say it like that. In closing, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Most people, when you say chapter 3, 16, automatically they think of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3.16, right? That's the famous 3.16. How many of you can quote 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That, the purpose for that is this that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Is right division important to you today? Is right division necessary for us today? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Our program today is being usurped by other people. It's being tangled up. It's being changed. It's being maligned. Everything that you can think of to try to take away the truth of what Paul wrote is being done. Satan's plan of evil. Oh, he was duped so bad. Scripture says if, if he would have known what the shedding of that blood on that cross would have accomplished, he would not have of let the Jesus Christ be crucified. He wouldn't have done that. But he did. And now he's as furious. For 2,000 years he's raged like a roaring lion. He wants you. And if you give him a chance, he'll eat your lunch. He's powerful. He can take you captive. Paul wrote in Timothy about those as being taken by 
captive of Satan at their own will. They let him do it. He's gotten a situation in the world today where pen, men don't know who God is. You read a verse that's talking about the God of this world and say, yeah, I know the God of this world. That's, that's Jesus. No, the God of this world is who? Amen. Satan. Without derision, you don't know the difference between the God of this world, Satan, and the God of heaven, the great Jehovah God of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you know him. I hope you love him. I hope you love his word. Meditate on it. Let it live in you. Let it dwell there. Ephesians says to be filled with the Spirit. Colossians, he says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And that's what we need to do. But rightly divided. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your Word. We thank you for... Uh, this church here and this community, what it means to us, these folks that are so faithful to come and, and, and to keep this work going. We thank you for the fellowship, the friendliness, the caring, the love of this little group of people. They're outstanding, Lord, but you know that. We thank you for them. We thank you for those, Lord, that would love to be here with us this morning but are not able we pray, Lord, that your word will comfort them, guide them, regenerate them, and help them to keep on keeping on to the end. We've got a course to finish. Help us to finish it. Help us to finish it with joy, as Paul says, with joy. Even though there's going to be tribulations, persecutions, and whatever, Rejoice. Paul says rejoice in all things, and again I say rejoice. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give you all the praise, for we know that all that we have, all that we're going to have, all that we are, all we'll ever be, is because of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that he might have all the prominence, preeminence, and all the honor, and all the glory. For we ask it in his precious name, and for his sake we pray. Amen. Questions or comments? <laughs>